All right. Good morning. I just want to make sure this is working before we get started. So, um, so today um, I'd like to start with uh, Tina. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Let's get started today. And uh, Nathan. You can help us get started today, and Austin. Okay. So, um, so we're going to talk about Harley Davidson. But before we actually talk about Harley Davidson, I want to start, and uh, I want to have Keen help us understand what Honda's strategy was coming in and competing with Harley Davidson in the United States. So, um, let's just start with what what was Honda's strategy. And why was why was Honda successful? Um, so it says that in 1859, Honda was already the largest motorcycle producer in the world. And okay, by what by what year? 1959. By 1959, they were the largest motorcycle producer in the world. Yeah, so they were okay. looking to expand into the United States for growth opportunities. Okay. Um, they did it by sort of taking the opposite sort of, I guess, brand as Harley Davidson, where Harley Davidson was the tough, like, all-American kind of thing. Honda came in and was like, oh, hey, you meet the nicest people at Honda, we're here to help you, like, we're completely op opposite of, like, this one sort of image. Okay. So, um, so would you view that as, was it a differentiation strategy? Was it a low-cost strategy? Um, it was definitely differentiation. For, for Honda relative to at least where Harley was? Yes. Okay. Um, and they also differentiated themselves in the types of motorcycles that they sold. Okay. So they really focused on lightweight bikes, whereas the Harleys were, I think, anywhere from um, 450 to 800 pounds. The Hondas were no more than so they're focusing more on smaller motorcycles. If we're looking at the, the, the markets they're in as uh, a company when they enter the U.S. market. Um, are they in other businesses besides motorcycles? Um, yes. But when they first came in, I think they were... I think their strategy was to enter the market in the smaller segment okay. and um, then look to expand, which is something that Harley wasn't really expecting. Okay. Um, they just sort of, I guess, wrote them off as a small thing and they didn't expect them to want to enter <coughs> the exact same segment of the market as Harley was in. Okay. So they come in. They, they, they have a, a strategy, a unique value that they're offering. You're saying they're somewhat differentiated. They're definitely lower cost. Yes. Right? Um, in what way would they be differentiated? Um, I guess in, um, even in the technology, okay. that they're more fuel efficient. Um, and they're less maintenance. Okay. Yeah, so there, um, we think about uh, Honda, when they come into the market, they have these low cost, fuel efficient, reliable motorcycles, which are different from a Harley motorcycle, which is high cost, not very fuel efficient, and not very reliable. So you could argue that in many ways they are taking a very different approach than Harley Davidson to the market. They start with smaller motorcycles, but they move up market and the motorcycles to eventually go into the large motorcycles, right? And they also have a very different uh, production process and different cost structure that okay. I think Harley does. So we think about their resources and capabilities that allow them to um, be low cost and reliable and fuel efficient they have a very different production process. And what do we know? Anything about that production process that might be different from Harley's? Um, it seems like from the reading that Honda had like more of the, I forgot what it was called, but so Harley seemed to just build each motorcycle like 
have it really based on the people and like have each different part put together, and so it seemed really inefficient. Whereas it seemed like the Hondas were manufactured um, in like like in a production chain almost. So good, good. So. So what, what, if you were going to take an operations class, they would talk about what they call job shop. The job shop process means that, um, in fact, um, it is not highly automated. Um, and uh, you're not doing high volumes. You're doing lower volumes. And you might be actually making each motorcycle a little bit different, which we find with Harley, they do a lot of customization in their motorcycles, right? A lot of sort of sort of people want their own customized motorcycle, whereas Honda they're just cranking out the same kind of bike over and over and over in more, what's more like a mass production, or today we call it more of a flexible um, or lean manufacturing uh, environment. So high vol very much high volume production. We might think about this as more sort of mass production or lean. Production. That's a very for a, a very different way of making a motorcycle. Okay. And um, is this hard to imitate, Tina? The high volume. Yeah. What what Han is doing? Um, I think so. Just because it requires a lot of infrastructure, like capital and plants. Okay. And so capital and plants would be barriers to imitating what they do. Yes. Um, also, it seems like there is definitely a huge technological barrier in terms of. It just seemed like Harley Davidson just wasn't looking to change at all. That they were sort of okay. holding on to this image of a classic Harley, like this is an icon, and we're not going to change it, even though um, technology is changing, and right. people are changing, and the markets are changing. We're Harley Davidson after all. Yeah. We don't need to change. All right. Any other comments, thoughts about Honda? Yeah. They have a decently steep learning curve. They're, okay. They're, because they're doing JIT, they <coughs> are learning how to do these really. And what is what is the learning curve or the experience curve look like? 15% uh, drop in every time you're going. 15? 15. One five. Yep. Okay. So we get basically a 15% decrease with every doubling of volume. And. Um, and actually, I think that those data we talked about last time are based upon price experience curves in the industry. So they just look at the price for certain motorcycles, you know, a certain CC, and they looked at how does that price change over time. So the price experience curve suggests probably a cost experience curve of roughly um, 85 uh, degrees or 15% drop with every doubling block. That means if you're coming in late, you're probably at a pretty significant cost disadvantage. Yeah, Chris. In addition to the high volume production, they also had a just in time system. So mm -hmm. they never really had inventory. They just moved it through with their orders while Harley Davidson had a lot of inventory in their shops. Yeah, yeah. Very different production systems. Uh, yeah. the other, we, we hit it a little bit earlier, but I'm, Honda had the capability to enter the American market with a big bike. They could have done it if they wanted to. They chose but, not to. But they chose not to, and and because they chose not to, they actually, and Harley was actually excited about this. They said, oh, people will graduate to our bikes after they've gotten used to the motorcycle through Honda. But um, So there's they, an interesting story here. Yeah. Actually, Honda came, and the first motorcycles they tried to sell were large motorcycles. Oh, really? In the US. Um, that's what they sort of pilot, because that's what they thought the American motorcyclist wanted. But their, break, their, their, their motorcycles, they broke down under the sort of, the, they, they weren't heavy uh, like a, a Harley. They weren't sort of used to this sort of, the, the, this sort of need for speed. So they tried those, um, and they found that they actually didn't work very well at first. This is sort of, the, the, you don't see this. This is uh, uh, sort of a well-known case years ago of Honda A and Honda B. So what they did, so they, they kind of launched there. They weren't very successful. They retreated. And then they decided to go with the small bikes, because they could see a market, and nobody was there. And then they gradually moved up market. Mm -hmm. and, and this is actually a strategy that, that has been used by quite a number of firms that I think is important for us to understand. So if we think about Honda's uh, approach in this particular market, motorcycles, and they do actually the same thing in cars. They later enter cars with the same approach. 
they start, if we think about price and quality or reliability, what you tend to expect is that as price goes up, quality goes up, right? That's sort of, and, and we, could, we could define this more broadly as performance. It could be reliability, it could be features, other things like that. So what happens is Honda comes into the market at a lower price. There's really not much there. And is their quality sort of better or worse than you think people would sort of expect for that price? Better. better. So they're actually, and some people would, would argue that Honda comes in and their strategy is really a value strategy. It's, you, you get a really good value with a Honda. Um, for the price, you're going to get better reliability, better performance than you might expect. So they come in with the low bikes. You think about these as the, you know, the 50 cc's, let's say, and you come out here to the 1,000 cc. So they start out and they launch here. And where's Harley on this? Harley's like over here, right? So if we think about Harley, Harley Davidson is more like here. Very high price, but relatively low quality in terms of reliability for the price. Now, there are reasons why people are still picking Harleys, but that's sort of where they are. And then what happens here is Honda then starts to move up market, right? So they, you know, they go to 100 cc and then 250, and then 500, and before you know it, or before Harley knows it, they've moved into the hundreds, the big, the thousand cc, the big motorcycles to compete directly with Harley. Things. And what they've done along the way is they've built customer loyalty. People who liked the motorcycles here tend to move up to the Honda motorcycles here, and they continue to build a customer base that becomes very loyal because they're used to getting, they, they want good value for the dollar. And that's what Honda is offering. So when they get to here, there are a lot of customers who say, you know, I'm going to get, I'm going to get better quality for the same price as a Harley Davidson, right? And so it's a much better value to me if I buy a Honda. And there's a certain segment of the market that wants that. <clears throat> we see this in uh, what they did in automobiles. So I'm not sure if some of you ever saw some of the first Honda Civics. The first one I, I saw, I swear, I thought they put two motorcycles side by side and just wrapped some metal over the top. It was so, it was small, it was ugly, it was like, and people were like, really? They, they're, you know, they're, they're making cars now? You know, I thought they made motorcycles, right? And then years later, then you start to see Honda lawnmowers. Right, and and there's there you know a lot of if you go to Home Depot you're going to see a lot of power sort of uh, power washers and other things that are powered by Honda motors. So they actually branch out. If, if we think about Honda, they're not just motorcycles, but they're in lots of other sort of related businesses as well. And I, this is also I think important to understand in terms of why they can have a technology advantage and a cost advantage. So um, what, do you think, um, what do you think their cost advantage might be? I'll open that up. Any ideas of what kind of a cost advantage they might have over, over Harley Davidson? Do we know how many, what their volumes are versus Richard? Uh, I don't know about volumes. I was going to say, like, in terms of experience, they their focus is really like on engines and on these manufacturing parts, and they're able to apply that to all these different equipment that they have. So that's why they're able to produce, you know, different types of machines because they're still applying sort of the same skills, just in different areas. Yeah, good point. Yeah, Phil. So I remember reading <clears throat> that when Harley got bought out, they added more people to their current production system, so mm -hmm. they started producing 70,000 bikes for, I don't remember the time unit, but they produced more bikes at the expense of quality. Whereas Honda had these lower labor costs because they had more of an assembly line just in time type of deal. And at the time they were producing more in Japan, when Japan was just a much cheaper labor market in the in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s. So overall they had a huge cost advantage with. Do we know how many motorcycles Honda was doing when Harley was doing seventy thousand? Any idea how many motorcycles Honda's doing? I thought they were selling three thousand uh fifty cc's a month or something. 
So we know they, they were saying even just that new one, they were doing 3,000 per month of just the 50 cc, right? So, so if we think about you know just the 50 cc, they're producing at least just for the U.S. market around 36,000 um, motorcycles. By comparison, actually, the, the, the 70,000 number for Harley Davidson compares to about five million motorcycles for Honda. So huge difference in the volumes that they're doing because J the Japanese market is actually a pretty big market for small transportation motorcycles, right? Especially back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, people couldn't afford cars, and so people were riding motorcycles. So Honda is the world leader in large part because they're selling a lot of motorcycles in Japan and in Asia, and then they come into the U.S. market. So Harley is way behind in terms of sort of the technology and the cost per unit. And in fact, um, let me just share uh, some analysis that we did at Bain & Company for a client that I think is actually relevant to this particular case. <laughs> Why it's hard for Harley Davidson to compete on technology and cost. So you remember we talked about um, doing this chart where you'll look at market share or unit volume, and you'll look at profitability. Let's put profits of different firms to see whether or not there's a relationship between volume or market share and profitability. So um, we had a team at Bain. We were working with a, a company that made um, um, uh, motorboat motors. And they did this chart, and it looked something like this. There were, um, there were I think, sort of four players, or three players down here, I remember. Mercury was one. Chrysler, actually, was one. There was Yamaha. Oh, a little bit higher. Yamaha was here. And Outboard Motor Company was the biggest company in the uh, industry was here. And that's what that chart looked like. So if you saw that chart, what, what, does, what does this suggest to you? What do you take away from this? Um, Are, there's likely a cost advantage from, produ from producing lots of engines. Yeah, so it looks like you're definitely better off if you're a big player, there's likely a cost advantage, perhaps a steep experience curve you might expect if you could do something on a unit basis. And yet, it seems like there's an outlier here, right? Yeah. Yamaha's yeah, also in other markets, right? And so that cost, R&D cost, uh, they have the same cost advantage as far as uh, volume goes. Okay. Because they're making motors that it looks like they can apply the same knowledge and the same concept, the same processes to across different Okay, so when we did this, they did this as market share of outboard motors. Uh, they didn't do it market share of all motors of a certain size and type. So when the team saw this, they then went, what, the reason you like to do this is you want to peel the onion. This, this tells you something and then you keep digging deeper to see if you can understand what's going on, right? So now the question was, what's Yamaha doing that's different? So when they went in, and they tried to figure out what's Yamaha doing different. Well, they're making motorcycle motors, right? And so ATV motors. So they're making other motors that are worthy of a similar size and type as a boat motor. And what they did is they then redid this analysis. And they did the market share, but they did it of a certain size of um, motor or engine. And what they found is that Yamaha leaped way up here, in fact, in terms of their total market share or their volume of that certain type of motor. And so now, all of a sudden, this changes the way you look at um, what, what you might need to do to be successful in this particular industry, right? What are, the, what are some of the implications now for, let's say, it's you know, Mercury or Outboard Motor Corporation? Probably. You're, it's, it'll be exceptionally difficult to compete with Yamaha on volume. Like if you're expecting to be at, uh, have the same cost advantage Yamaha does, <coughs> you're, you're going to be in for a hard time for a long time because they just you'll never be able to produce motorcycles and ATVs and uh, dirt bikes and jet skis and all. You're not going to be able to do all of that in that group. Okay, so you're going to have a hard time competing on cost and technology <laughs> unless, unless what? Maybe you should partner with Honda. 
unless you figure out perhaps how to get, maybe you should be in some of those other businesses. This would lead you to believe maybe we need to diversify and expand into these other businesses, or maybe we need to partner with another company who's in these other businesses where we can share knowledge and technology. That might be another option. Or if we don't think we can compete, if we can't do that, then we better be good at differentiating. We better be designing our motors, our, our boat motors, to somehow be differentiated versus the competition. Otherwise, we're gonna, we're gonna have a tough time competing in this particular business, okay? So, so I think those are a couple of interesting and important lessons related to Honda coming in and being successful and starting at the low end and moving to the high end. They did it in cars. Um, and then once they got to a certain point though in cars, they changed the brand. Why? They didn't do it motorcycles. Why do you think, Joe? Because people are already associating Honda with kind of that cheaper price. And if they want to have like a luxury car, then they should probably just have a different brand to associate that with. Yeah. So, so Toyota uses the same approach. Sort of started with small cars. They move up. So Honda launches Acura brand. Toyota launches Lexus. They're all made in the same plant. Um, makes us feel good that we're buying a Lexus, but it's really a Toyota. You know, it's in a Toyota plant. And it, it, they actually, they finally launched a Lexus brand, I understand, in Japan. Um, but it was like 20 years later, because they didn't need, Toyota had a good brand. So they didn't even bother. So none of them had their higher end brands. They didn't, they didn't waste the effort of launching the high end brand. But in the US, we want, if we're buying a nicer car, we want a different dealership. You know, we, we don't want to be there with the people that are buying <laughs> Honda and Civics and that. You know, we want to be in a different dealership with a nicer buying experience, right? This is just part of the U.S. customer and the U.S. market. Um, but what we see, and we'll talk about this when we get later into the course, this notion of coming in at the low end. And we sometimes see companies come in at the low end of a market and they move up market. And this is a way that they actually eventually move into the high end to compete with a competitor that ignored them at the beginning because they didn't think they'd be a competitor and didn't see the trajectory of them being able to come up market. All right, so let's now talk about Harley Davidson. So um, Nathan, Harley's having a, a hard time competing with Honda when they come into the market, but let's just sort of give me the overview. Harley Davidson, what's their strategy? Uh, luxury bikes. Okay, so if we think about sort of the market, it's sort of luxury, high-end motorcycles, yeah. okay? Very strong brand image. Okay, so if they're, this is clearly, if we think about their unique value, it's brand image is really important, so it's clearly a differentiation strategy and the thing that's providing the differentiation is largely brand image. Um, what else? Resources and capabilities, how are they doing this? Prior to Honda, I think? Yeah, at, just at the time they were competing with Honda, when they come into the market, yeah, when, and, and pretty much all along, they haven't changed their strategy a lot. Well, I don't know, from my recall, it's just kind of like, those were the two main things that they were like. Okay, this is what they're good at. Yeah. Um, it's not clear that they're really good at production, right? So uh, you wouldn't really call that a resource or a capability. Um, Austin? They're trying to play on like customization, personalization, but then the quality really isn't as good as it kind of makes it sound like it's good. Yeah, so if we think about resources, and I'll, I'll break that out from capabilities. So clearly the resources brand, right? They do have some capabilities, some processes to allow customization. Though, right? You go in and they'll give you all of these options to customize your bike. So I would say actually they have, it, it, it increases the cost a lot, but they have built in an option for people to come in and customize their motorcycle. And they'll provide financing for you to do it because they expect you to buy a motorcycle that is highly customized. They want you to. After all, Harley's all about identity, right? And you want it to be, you don't want it to look like anybody else's. You want a Harley Davidson that is unique to you. That's part of the brand image. So they do build in these capabilities of customization. So the customer group is also a pretty resource, right? I mean, just the fact that they have like the hog, like the okay, right? Harley yes. So if you think about loyal customers, these are people who will tattoo 
your name, your logo on their body. Okay? If you wanted to try and figure out measures of loyalty for a company, and you went out and, and you, you sort of, the survey was, what percentage of your customers have tattooed your logo on their body? Harley Davidson probably has the greatest brand loyalty of any right? I don't know how many people out there have a Honda logo, you know, on their, you know, on their bicep or you know, someplace on their body, but I doubt very many do, right? So, um, so if we're thinking about sort of brand loyalty, clearly that you know something's something's happened to build this loyal customer base, which is clearly a resource that they leverage. And you got to give them some credit. Um, the Harley Owner Group is something that they've helped initiate, right? The Hog, um, which helps them to, to sort of build customer loyalty, right? All right. So, so they're competing. We know they're competing in sort of a different part of the market relative to Honda, and they run into they run into some big troubles because their costs are just out of whack. The reliabilities. Just not, not good. So, so what do they do, Nathan, to sort of recover? What are some of the key things they do to sort of get back on track? Yeah, so they're acquired by AMF. AMF focuses a lot on just production, just producing a lot of motorcycles. Okay. And the quality went down a lot, like I said. And so it was really hard for them because that's what people associated with, and they didn't want to have crummy motorcycles. Where Honda had its production value, but they were very reliable. And so they had to reevaluate, and so they actually ended up is going to one of the Honda operation plants. Okay. So if we think about fixing Harley Davidson in the early 80s, where so they're almost bankrupt, AMF has bought them, and then the, an owner group decides to take them private. Um, one of the things they've got to do is they, they, they have to fix quality, right? And <coughs> to some extent, they've got to improve costs. Are they as good at, after they do this, are they as good as Honda on cost and as good at Honda on quality? I would say they're as good. They definitely improved from okay. where they were. Yeah, so, so really, when you think about how you compete, let's, they, they don't compete on cost. They don't compete on reliability. But if you're really, really bad, it's a problem for many customers. I mean, if, if you have to go in and people go in and they say, I want that motorcycle, but why is there cardboard under it and what's that oil doing on the cardboard? You know, if it's actually leaking oil when you buy it, that's a problem, right? And in fact, um, I remember one of the sayings, um, this is back in the 70s, so when I'm in uh, high school, uh, was if someone owned a Harley Davidson, uh, the response was, oh, I didn't know you were a mechanic. <laughs> because you better be a mechanic if you own a Harley Davidson, because you were going to have to be fixing, you know, that bike because of the problems that it has. So, so what they do is they're trying to fix quality, improve costs, just so they're not horrible. What else do they? What else do they do? Um, they start leveraging their brand in a in a like monetizable way. So up, in, up until AMF acquired them. And, even a little bit afterwards, they, they relied on their brand to fuel their motorcycle sales, but selling like t-shirts and jackets and that kind of thing, that wasn't quite part of their business model until later. And now it's what, what they say, it's about 25% of the revenues coming from that, so. Okay, so they actually start to leverage their brand and getting into merchandising. Yeah. I would right. say like, what they started developing was a unique value of the experience of Harley Davidson. Kind of the Harley Davidson experience rather than, because um, this is a, my wife's a life management major, and this is a really popular case for them because they didn't just sell the bikes, they started selling an experience, so she's an experience management. Okay. And so they said that mixing in merchandise was kind of a part of theming the experience to be able to help Harley Davidson people have an experience that they could remember rather than just buying a bike just like they could get from Honda. Or so now you're, you're getting this you customized know. bike, you're getting the leather jackets with the Harley <coughs> stuff on it, you know, yeah. scarf for your dog, you know, lamp, whatever it might be. But it's now this is part of an experience that they're creating for their customers. So um, let's, before we jump to experience, because I do think this is an important issue, um, I want us to quickly do a classic segmentation analysis. Classic customer segmentation analysis. Um, and by that I mean, 
that I want us to try to see if we can look at the features that matter to a Honda rider. So we're going to diff we're going to basically do a segmentation based upon the features that people consider when they buy a bike, when they buy a motorcycle. Okay. Um, so the way you tend to do this is you first of all identify the features that people might care about. Now let me just ask. Um, by raising your hand, how many of you have owned or ridden a motorcycle? All right, so I want you're going to be part of our initial population. When you went out to buy a motorcycle, what features did you consider? Just go ahead and start naming them. Price. Loud. Price, okay. Loud? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to put importance on this dimension. You often will do this on a 1 to 5, 1 to 7 scale. 1 to 7 is a Likert scale, which is usually used most frequency because it, frequently because it tends to maximize variance. It's a little better than a 5-point scale. But we'll just say 1 to 5 importance low to high. And then as you start to think about the features that matter, um, we'll identify them price. Someone said loud or the, the noise it makes. Okay, so you want it to be a loud noise? I want it to sound pretty. Okay, so, so the noise, I'm not, I'm not the writing. sound, I'm not does, a, does a Harley Davidson sound pretty? Yeah. Okay, so so um, so there are so we have to distinguish here. So I'm going to do this as a loud noise, so that um, it, it, it's actually very distinctive, and, and this is true for Harley Davidson. So I have I actually I have a brother-in-law who owns a Harley Davidson, and I have a brother-in-law who owns a Honda Goldwing. And one of them, actually, he wants it to be quiet. The other one wants it to be loud, right? So, you know, I have a couple of neighbors with Harley Davidsons. When they leave the neighborhood, you know, right? It's like, okay, there goes Joe. You know, he's riding his Harley Davidson out of the neighborhood, and we all know because we can hear him, right? And yet other people want it. So we're going to do this as uh, uh, we're going to do this as sort of a, a loud noise or sound important high versus the opposite of that would be if they actually prefer it quiet. Okay, what other features do you size? S size, okay. So we're gonna assume this is a, a, a similar sized, sort of a mid-sized motorcycle. Okay, so we're, we're, we're gonna control for size. What else, so if you really look at price, noise? Comfortability. Comfort, okay, so we're gonna put comfort, how comfortable is the, it to, to, to sit on? And sort of related to that, I'll do ease of handling. So it's sort of comfortable to sit on and then ease of handling. What else? We can control like, how powerful it is. Like Power? 150 cc or 200 cc. Yeah, but even at the same cc, there's the issue of the the speed with which the, the, the torque, right? So how quickly it accelerates and the technology that it uses to accelerate. So we're gonna, we'll do this as sort of power acceleration. Okay, what else might matter? Yes. Is that like image or just how it looks? Yeah, design. Okay, we're going to do a brand um, as a certain image right, is separate, right. but where's, you know, do I like the design? Reliability. Yeah, reliability. Is this reliable? <coughs> um, let's also put fuel efficient. Yes? Now, we're, are we assuming, like, I know people buy motorcycles for different reasons. Some just to kind of cruise around town, others to go on bike trips, others to race, so I think how you plan on using your motorcycle is, is going to determine. Okay, so, so now he's sort of getting at this issue that certain types of bikes are already designed to do a certain job for you, right? Because some are like the touring bikes, it's for a, like a road trip. And then you've got bullet bikes that are for speed, right? So you actually have different kinds of motorcycles for different kinds of uses. Let's assume, again, we're going to control for size, of the motorcycle, and this would be, you know, your around town or a touring bike could be any any of those. But we'll control because they've already done some customization there. Um, what about customizability? Some people care about that. Is it customizable? Um, so, what's the price? What kind of sound does it make? Is it comfortable? Is it easy to handle? How does it, what's the power acceleration like? Do I like the design? Do I like the, 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 the brand? 
Um, is it reliable? Is it fuel efficient? Is it customizable? All right. Anything else? I just think it's funny that safety's not on here. Yeah, that's true. Well, if you're buying a motorcycle, you've already thrown that out the window <laughs> to begin with. Um, uh, unless you're like me, see, so I have, uh, I have uh, uh, my oldest son raced ATVs, and that convinced me that I should, you know, we had a, 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 we had a Honda shadow for a while, but it convinced me that I should ride a Vespa. Right, this little scooter, you know, that's, that's like my, my speed is scooter speed. I don't want to get hurt. Um, but uh, you could, we'll sort of put that in with ease of handling and safety. All right, yes? I had a good friend of mine who rode a lot of motorcycles, and uh, one thing that was important to him is he wanted to see how the person in the back seat, how they would have to hold on. So if they weren't hugging him, he didn't want to buy the bike. So. Yeah, okay, there we go. So the, 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 hug, the hug factor, the hug factor. Uh, somehow. <laughs> All right, we'll have to think about how we put that one up there, the hug factor. All right, so now if you were, if you were doing this and you were trying to just understand what, what, what matters to people in different segments, then you would select some motorcycle people who you know, were in the market for motorcycles, and you'd go through and you'd say, okay, how important is this on a one to five scale? And then, and you go and you and you you'd have each of them do that, and it would start to give you a picture of how important each of these features are for the different riders and what segments. If there are certain, if there are certain patterns that emerge where certain types of customers tend to prefer the same kinds of things. So, is there anybody in here who has, who has either owned a Harley Davidson or has like a close family member who owned a Harley Davidson that you think you kind of know how, how how they would think about the, these features? You have someone who's that? It's my aunt. Your aunt? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> aunt, aunt what? Aunt Mary. Aunt Mary. Okay. <laughs> so Aunt Mary's a Harley rider, and you think you could sort of answer? Anybody else know a Harley rider? Yeah. No, a few cousins. A few cousins? No. Okay. So, all right. So I want you to answer for Aunt Mary and your cousins, as though they were the ones um, choosing here. On price, how important was price when they went out to buy a motorcycle? Not a big deal. Not a big deal. No, it's not a big deal. Not a big deal. So like one, right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. It's, if you're buying a Harley Davidson, price is probably not a big deal. So price is not very important. How important is the loud noise? Very, yeah. very important. Very okay, so now we've got loud noise, very important. Um, all right, what about comfort? Not, so it was like, if she's not riding it for longer than like 40 minutes a week, maybe tops. It was like she's just cruising around in it for a little bit. So, so maybe two or three? What do you think? I'd say my cousin's is a little bit more important than that. For example, the Harley's are a lot more comfortable than like a bike, so to say. So. OK, so we'll so put it more in the middle, like around a three. OK, what about um, ease of handling? How important is that? She got a smaller bike for that reason. Like, it's not, it's not. I mean, it's bigger than any bike I could ride, but it was still small. <laughs> <laughs> this is Big Aunt Mary. <laughs> so, um, so she got one that was a little bit smaller. But you think ease of when she goes out, comparing them with other motorcycles, do you think she got the, the one that was the easiest to handle? It's probably, it's probably like three and a half to four. It's okay. Right around. Not, not the easiest to handle. So. Not the easiest to handle. So you say lower than that. Yes. Okay, so again, what you're going to see here, and I'm just going to put sort of little, little bit, there are some differences between Harley riders as well. Some is going to matter, this is going to matter a little bit more, some is going to matter less. The early Harley riders actually wanted this to be a one. They wanted it to be hard to ride a Harley Davidson, right? So that if you went out on the Harley and you fell over, you didn't deserve to be in the club, right? I mean, it was, it was like they wanted it not to be easy. They've changed since they started focusing more on women. They actually have tried to make them uh, easier to handle. And I think it matters more for, for women than men. I think that would be a, a, probably a standard difference we'd see between men and women. All right, how important is power and acceleration? Not as important as like loudness, but it was, I don't know, so it's maybe a four. Maybe a four? Yeah, a little bit above the middle. She never, she never goes, like, she hardly goes on the highways. It frightens her to do that, so. So she's not going too fast. It's not, she's not out there racing or, yeah. Okay. Uh, design. How important was the design of the bike? It was super, oh, yeah. So she wanted, like, it has skulls and everything. <laughs> <laughs> it has skulls and everything? Yeah. So like, this is, now we're getting customizability. <laughs> it That's extremely important. important. So this is like a five. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, how important was the brand? It was very important. It's very important. So that's probably about a 5.2. How important was that it was reliable? 
I think that middle. justified her spending so much on it by that she. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe probably in the middle. It doesn't. It, and it didn't matter that it was fuel efficient. <laughs> no. no. She rides for like 40 minutes. Time. Yeah, so it doesn't matter. So we could basically now, if we if we had just gone out and surveyed a thousand people, and there were, um, let's say, 200 that had this pattern, then you know that they're looking that they're looking for this pattern of features that matters to them. Right? And that's what helps you segment the market into groups of customers who want the same kinds of things. All right. So now, who in here um, has um, owned a Honda or knows somebody who is a sort of a, a Honda rider? I own a Bullet bike. I owned a Bullet bike last year for a trade. Okay, so Bullet bike is going to be a different segment altogether because you're looking for speed. This is where you actually would find sort of real differences in terms of the feature set that you're looking for. So I'm, I'm, I want something that is more like a, a, you know, around town, riding, maybe some touring as opposed to someone who wants to kill themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> bullet, yeah, bullet bikes. Um, this, uh, when my son raced ATVs, uh, I, I, I quickly learned, as they get better and better, and he did a couple of national races, it's, it's not a matter of if you'll get hurt. It is when. You will get hurt. When you're going at those speeds on a track with all of those other folks and you're all jumping, at some point you're going to land on somebody's bike and you I mean, you will get hurt. Um, and, and he learned that he, he got hurt. But fortunately, um, he, got, uh, uh, he, got, he got out of it before he got hurt too bad. Only, only <coughs> two plates in his arm and 13 screws, I think, is all he ended up with. Uh, all right, yes, Carrie. Oh. Um. Just an answer to who's on a Honda. Yeah, Honda. Uh, I'm speaking for Scott because he doesn't have a voice. Okay. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> he, he says he's had a Honda, Suzuki, Yamaha, and BMW. Okay. So you can represent the other, all, all of sort of these other factions of bikes. Okay. So, we like to speak for you. You can do one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Um, anybody else feel like they sort of understand someone who, you know, as bought like a Honda or a Yamaha or Kawasaki. My sister. Did. Your sister did as well. My uncle. <laughs> Your uncle had had a Goldwing. Yeah. All right. So all right. So Scott, Chris, we can sort of jump in. Tell tell me how important was price. Three. Three. Four. Okay. So oh, certainly more important. What about a loud noise? Did you want a loud noise? She wanted it quiet. She wanted it quiet. One. You wanted it quiet too. Okay. <laughs> Just like you are today. <laughs> um, comfort. Comfort was comfort. Five. Pretty important. Four. Okay. So comfort. Uh, ease of handling. Three. Three. Three to four. Okay. So about the same. Okay. Uh, power and acceleration. Two. Two. Four. Okay. So we get a little bit of a difference here. Comfort was a design. Three or four. Three or four. Pretty important. Four. Okay. So design is pretty important. Brand. One. Didn't really matter which brand. One. Same thing. So it could have been could have been a Honda, Suzuki, Yamaha. Yamaha, whichever one was sort of the best deal and fit you with these other the other issues. Okay. Um. Well, what about uh, reliability? How important is reliability? Four. Four. Five. Okay. So reliability. And fuel efficient? Four. 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 Okay, so fuel efficient is pretty important. And how important was it to customize? One. One, two, a little bit. But for the most part, you're not customizing the, the Honda. Um, and now, if we sort of, if we did this with a large sample of uh, customers, what you'd see is clearly a different pattern of features that they're looking for. <laughs> Right? And that's how you start to think about segmenting the market. So if you were going out the first time you're looking for, you were launching, you know, you, you, were, you were looking to launch a new product, let's say, and you were out there um, surveying customers of, of a current product, or people who haven't bought the product yet, what you might be looking for is a segment where they want a mix of features that's a little different than it's being offered today. And that's the way you could differentiate, is that then you tailor your offering to, to do a, you know, a better job of meeting those um, sort of specific needs 
And that's a way to differentiate for that particular customer segment. Okay. So um, now I want now that we've sort of looked at at, at sort of how Harley Davidson looks different from its competitors on a set of different features. I want to now um, look at some commercials for Harley Davidson, and I want you to tell me. We'll go over each. I want you to tell me what is the differentiator. What are they really emphasizing here in the um, in these commercials? Okay. <clears throat> so I'm hoping this will be able to hear this. on differentiation, not cost. What's the what's the differentiator here? Yes, Claire. I think it's like a status differentiation. Obviously, the woman's mind here is a lot bigger deal once you have a hundred. Yeah, so clearly this is a status, this is a status issue. So if we use this terminology of you hired to do a job, what job are you hiring a Harley to do? Um, honestly, the, the thought I had was that uh, I guess the job is I'm in a midlife crisis and I need to resolve it. <laughs> so I think that's Did that guy look midlife to you? Oh, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's a little younger than I was. <laughs> yeah, so that's why I think they got in a bit of trouble. I right, got into like a sticky wicket, you know, when they changed the production and they got like a kind of worse quality bike. So if you're in a midlife crisis, you want to, you know, feel good and like have a sweet bike, but if it's leaking oil, and that kind of ruins that's the That's not good. Point. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Why do you why are why is this guy wanting now to hire a Harley? What's he hiring a Harley to do? Well, I think it was back to just Harley from the beginning, right? They were they were known for speed and being rebellious. They created an image, and Hollywood helped in that. Um, and it was all about this image. And, and he talked about that. I live my life on the edge. Blah blah. blah. I'm I'm daredevil. It's like that's that's the image that Harley creates. And so right, right. Um, it's selling people on the idea that they can yeah. be yeah. they can become this. They can take on this image. Yeah. Harley. I mean, if you get right down to it, let's be honest. He wants to hire a Harley to get the girl, yeah. right? Yeah. Isn't this the status with the girl? Yeah. It's, they're basically saying, if, do you want to do you want to look good in the eyes of of, of girls, guys? <laughs> you know, they get a Harley, right? That I mean, it is very, very. It's like the job to be done here is to in, in, in enhance your status, and this will make you more attractive to the opposite sex. And it's, and, it's, and it's sort of pretty clear. All right, let's look at the next one. And um, you can tell me what you think. Let's see if that's this. You know, when I was a young man, riding a Harley Davidson motorcycle, oh, that's all I could think of. I mean, the oak of road, the rumbling engine, the wind in my face. Oh, what? No, I never got it. I spent the money on aluminum siding instead. Let's go see what Grandma's doing. <laughs> All right, what's the, what's the differentiator? What are they selling here? <laughs> what is it? Awesome. Being a cool grandpa. Being a cool grandpa. Do you want your grandkids to like you, you need to have driven a Harley. Okay. <laughs> you want to be a cool grandpa? Just yeah. if you want to have a cool life, like your life you'll look back on and regret it if you didn't have a Harley. <laughs> it's true, right? It's about this Harleys will make you an interesting person. Right? It will you you now become an interesting person if you've owned a Harley. 
right? It's like, Grandpa, oh, you wrote a Harley? It's like all of a sudden they're interested. And, and I don't know if you saw, the, I think at the end it said, think of the stories you will tell, yeah. right? It's, it's like you will, you will become an interesting person if you have a Harley Davidson. Okay? Now, where was that on our features when you're going in to buy a bike? It's sort of, it, it has to fit into the, 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 this sort of notion of a brand, right? And experience, you know, that you're mentioning. Um, but in fact, it's not a feature that you could point to very easily that you say, oh, I'm, I want to buy this motorcycle because it's going to make me an interesting person. It will, you know, it will give me some stories to tell my grandkids. Okay. All right, let's look at um, one more. <laughs> and I like the... Especially with the grandpa, find your dealer fast. <laughs> it's like you better not wait if you're getting older. There's not much. Uh, there's not much time to become interesting. All right. Nice Harley. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to get one of those myself, but uh, it's got the 6495 on a killer dinette set. It's tough, you know? It's Harley, dinette set, Harley, dinette set. The old new Sportster is here. Went with the dinette set. The bike you've always wanted starts at 6495. All right. What are they selling there? What do you think? I just thought it was interesting when he goes, nice Harley. The guy was like, hey, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. It was like, thanks. It's like, I don't care. Of course. Yeah, it's <laughs> like that all the time. I have a big deal. You get it right. What do you think they're, what are they trying to get across with this commercial? Yeah. So in order to like, be a man, you have to own a Harley. If you're not buying a Harley, you're buying a dinette set. A killer dinette yeah. set. <laughs> it's, it, it's like, hey, come on. Be a man. Yeah. Don't cave in and get a killer dinette set. <laughs> get a Harley, right? Yeah. So my dad kind of went through a midlife crisis and got a Harley Davidson. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like really embarrassing for my family, but. Because <laughs> <laughs> you like. You notice she wasn't willing to speak up earlier yeah. than the Harley segment like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, he likes driving, and I don't know if you know, but he like the guy who rode up with other bikers. Right. And so we'll be like driving and like we'll go like boating in the summer and it's always like huge motorcycle crews. And my dad will just be like, oh, my brothers. And we're like, dad, don't say that. They don't know you. How's it going? Like, and they all like talk about their bikes. And like, my dad honestly hasn't even ridden his in like a couple years because now he thinks it's like really dangerous. So he like switched like a sports car, like same thing, you know? But, like, it's so funny because he's like, oh, my brothers. Like, it's such like a camaraderie. And like, if they see each other like on the road, they like, they like have a wave, like they just do it, and like they don't do it to like Honda riders or anyone else. But it's so <laughs> weird. Yeah. You are part of a club. Yeah. So I think one of the things when you see these people riding in, it's a it's a very subtle thing here, but they have it in other things is that when you buy a Harley, you now become part of a club of brothers, right? It's like this band that we go out, we ride together. This is a way you can hire a community of friends. And it, that's, this is very important for a lot of people. Um, it's a way to, to meet people who have sort of similar interests. And they like to go out and do these rides together. So I think there is this notion of the, the ownership group that is sort of subtle in here. There's the, hey, you know, be a man, stand up, and you know, get the Harley, don't get the killer dinette set. And it's like, that's lame. I don't know if you saw the look at the girl yeah. at the very end when she's like, huh? You got the, you went for the killer dinette set? Even she, they wanted even the, the woman to look at him like, really? <laughs> um, and th but they do one other thing in this commercial. They actually, it's the first time you ever see anything about price. Did you notice how they got the price in there? How much is it? How much is the Sportster? Sixty-four ninety-five. How do you all remember that from the commercial? Sixty-four ninety-five. No, that was the price of the dinette set. That was the same price, right? They they were able to get that in there. That for sixty-four ninety-five, you can be in a Harley Davidson, or you can get a killer dinette set. But now you know the, the the price, right? That it's not it's not maybe this big hurdle that you had expected. It's the price of a killer dinette set. You know, it's like come on. Um, you know, forego that, and you could be part of this club and be part of. I mean, again, the, the writers are attract, you know, attractive, cool, you know, the kind of the kind of group you want to be part of, right? 
So, so this, is, um, this has been really important to Harley's success. When you can't sell a bike that has electronic fuel injection and has good technology and is reliable, you know, they were able to actually build on this early theme of sort of rugged individualism and, and, and rebellion. And I think that uh, it, it's important to appreciate the role that the brand has played in the success of the company over the last 30 years as they've come back. So this there was raised this notion of about merchandising. So Harley uses its brand name valued at you know six billion to sell other products. You know, so um, there are a whole variety of different products that they now sell. If you go into the Linden, you go into a Harley Davidson <coughs> shop, ask for a brochure on their motorcycles. And um, I, I did this a few years ago. They gave me a brochure that was about this big on the motorcycles, and it was about this, you know, it was about this thin. You know, there's only sort of so many, but like this. And then you ask for uh, a, a, a catalog of their merchandise, and it's like this big, and it's like this thick, right, of, of merchandise that you can buy. And um, think about what is the, what kind of profitability does Harley generate off of its merchandise. So we know the revenues are roughly, it's 25% of revenues come from merchandise. What percentage of their profits do you think come from this? Yes? I, I, I think in the case it's 25% of profits. Okay. Um, and then it says uh, every time they license it, it's 10 to 30% uh, premium just goes to them for doing nothing. Yeah. So to, what is your cost to license your brand? It's really, it's the few people that you have that actually have to say, as they field proposals, yes, you can do that. But it's a very, very small investment. And in fact, pretty much all of their revenues from merchandising are profits because the costs to generate it are so low because it's all generated off of the brand. So in fact, the return on the capital employed, the, the return on your expenses, for um, merchandising is extraordinarily high. If you can leverage your brand in different ways like Harley's been able to do, um, then obviously you're gonna substantially increase your profitability. If they only did motorcycles, then basically they would lose 25% of you know, their profits. If it's 25% of profits. Um, so they would be much less profit. The value of their company would drop by 25%. So a quarter, a quarter of Harley Davidson's market value could, can be attributed to, uh, to their, their merchandising, which is pretty significant. Yes? One thing I did I thought was really smart was they were afraid of the image being diluted if too many items have the image on it. And so they yes. had like a rigorous screening process to make sure that it fits this Harley Davidson image. I think it's really smart. Yeah. yeah. So, so now there's an interesting question um, that I want to now address for a moment. Harley, um, we see they're looking to grow. And this is a challenge that they're facing. It's sort of the end of the case is, you know, they, they, they've, since, since they went private and then went public, we see this trajectory of growth in revenues and profits. And then we see 2008, 2000, all of a sudden we get this downturn. And they, they're sort of coming back. But it's not clear they'll be able to continue to grow as they have in the past because they've sort of saturated their traditional customer segment of, you know, sort of 25 to 60 year old sort of mostly white men in the United States. So can, do you think they can, and Austin, I'll put this to you, do you think they can be successful in China and should they make the investment to try and make Harley successful in China? What I remember from reading is that when they did go to China, the price more than doubled. Costs like so much more because of the tariffs, right? And when you and when you when you target a small segment, like what they're doing kind of here in the U.S., you know, they have a really loyal customer base, but it's so small, it's kind of hard to get other people because it's just such a narrow target, right? It's just a narrow segment, and they would kind of do that. If they went to China, but with a different segment, they'd only be focusing on people who are wealthy, and they have to like the kind of bike as opposed to a Honda. So I think that expanding internationally, I don't think it's I don't think it's the right way to go with the Harley Davidson. I think that a lot of what we talk about in our group is create a subdivision, you know, kind of like Honda and Acura, mm -hmm. Toyota and Lexus. I think Harley's so good at creating that love group that they should apply that and create a different kind of love group with a different brand. 
with a different kind of bike and sort of apply some of the same principle of what, what do they do to attract this specific target segment? What can we do to attract that younger target segment with a different brand? And you try and do that in the U.S. market, try and come out with I a different brand? First. I, try to, I, try to, I try to focus here first because okay. of all the tariffs and the an increase in price. I think that you're just, they're limiting their segment as they move out internationally. So I think I focus here first with a different subdivision. So would you actually create different dealerships that have different brand on it, or would you sell those motorcycles at the Harley-Davidson dealerships? I think I'd go as far as switching it completely. I'd, I'd take Trying to build out a whole new. I'd, I'd build out a whole, I'd, I'd apply those capabilities and resources that, that we have as Harley with that ability to create a strong brand, and I'd apply those principles that we know to a completely different brand. And have them be bikes that are compete more on the same features yeah, that more on the technology, and, more on fuel efficiency, maybe maybe even enter into more of like kind of the bullet bike, the rice rock stuff we were talking about to target more of a younger, younger audience. Okay, well, what do you think? So, I had an uncle who had a Harley. Oh, I, didn't, I don't know anything about how often he rode or anything like that, but... Can you speak up so they can hear you over on the other side, and then I'll get to Andrew? Yeah, go ahead. He was, he was born in Brazil, you know, grew up in Brazil, moved here with his wife, my aunt, and, and he ended up buying a Harley. And now that I think about it, that's kind of weird, because, you know what, part of his upbringing made him attracted to the idea of getting a Harley when he came to the United States, right? And so I actually wonder if you could market the American bike experience to international people mm -hmm. who want to have American experiences, right? And so I think maybe it's, uh, China could be a tough, tough market to start with, even though there's a lot of people. You could start in a different country, you know? But there, I'm certain that there's a lot of people in international markets that want to have more American Experience. Sort of American experience. So, so continue to leverage that brand. Don't try and change it internationally, and just try and see if you can draw, find which countries people want the American, uh, an American bike or that sort of American experience. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would say that you wouldn't change the brand. But you have to change the bike. Um, I I served uh, I served a mission in Malaysia, and I think a lot of like. A lot of other countries, they would love the American experience, but the fact is they're they're just too small to ride Harley bikes, and, and they're too poor to afford them. So like, I think you can deliver the American experience, but let's change the product a little bit. I mean, they're not going to notice because you know they're still riding around in their little hundred cc um, Hondas. So I mean, a four hundred cc bike would be huge to them, right? And so I think don't change the brand, but change the bike for your international. Um, audience. Okay, so we have to sort of recognize, in fact, literally physically, we tend to be larger, especially than, than Asian, you know, people in Asian countries. And so they're actually going to have to maybe design and produce a different bike altogether. Yeah. And so, so piggyback off a little bit of what Taylor mentions, um, I don't think China's the right market for Harley to go and compete. Um, yeah, I think that they need to go to the because... market. <clears throat> so in Asia, brands and recognition and status, um, Tyson mentioned before the idea of face. Um, in, Asian, in all Asian cultures, it's extremely important. And Harley doesn't have enough of a, a high quality and high recognizable brand for an Asian person to want to purchase their bike uh, and use it, as well as the size and other, other issues. So they would need to upscale their brand in the US and then also downsize the bike, which are two almost conflicting ideas. And so getting into the Asian market would be extremely difficult. So let me ask you this question. Um, in some ways, the, you know, we've talked about Harley has sort of this unique history in the U.S., where it was featured in these certain prominent films and certain actors, and so it developed this image. The question is: Is this transferable across markets? Is there is their source of differentiation transferable to another country? What do you think? What do you think? I think you can transfer to other countries, but specifically Asia, I don't believe it's. Yeah, it's going to be a smooth transition. So it's an interesting thing. In Asia, are, is, it, is it a good thing to be a rebel? <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not at all, <laughs> right? In fact, so I served my mission in, in South Korea and have done a lot of research in Japan. And I just remember you know, the, the, the saying that they have there is that the nail that sticks out, what happens to it? It's hammered in, right? You don't want to stick out. And so it's an interesting question around whether or not you can transfer your differentiation advantage if you're Harley to another country. 
if, in fact, you don't have this history of having actors write it, or that there's at least, you have to have a segment of the population that wants to identify with that brand image. And so I would suspect, yeah, Asia's probably going to be tough because, again, smaller, as was in indicated, they're just smaller people. It's harder to ride the big motorcycles. They have a lot of restrictions around the large motorcycles as well. And then it's not clear that the brand image is going to pull lots of people. So you're going to probably be a very, very niche player in those markets if you, you know, if you, if you go in with your same brand image and a similar kind of bike. It's, I mean, they sold what they said. They said sold more motorcycles in the Milwaukee dealership than in all of China in 2010. That's not very good. You know, when you're selling like less than you know 500 motorcycles a year in China, are going to cut over a million people. Yes. Yeah, I mean, kind of piggybacking on your idea. I think a huge opportunity in Latin America, uh, particularly like in Mexico, because people come here all the time, you know, legally or, or legally. And uh, the first thing they do is they get their job working, you know, minimum wage. They're sending money home, and they buy a big, massive Ford truck. So they can't afford it, but they want to live. They want to be an American. They want to live in LA. They want to, you know, be in these big cities. So, you know, if you can think of, okay, as a substitute of a big truck or a big fancy, you know, car that a lot of these Latins want, you get a Harley. So you can tailor that to them. I mean, I think you get some. You get the ability to, to build out your brand here in the United States. I mean, hey, we're going to do a big hog race, and we're going to do it down in Mexico City. Right. You can get a lot of people that are willing to do that. Um, <laughs> so, so now, so what the, the issue is that looking at different countries and cultures and seeing which ones might fit best with you know the the brand image for Harley, and where there may be that same aspiration to be more like uh, you know American. Yeah. American. So it could be South America is a market that you would want to invest a lot more than perhaps Asia or Europe. Okay. Yes. Kind of following Christensen's arguments about what are you hiring it to do for you. Uh -huh. In these other markets, it's a lot different because you hire your motorcycle to get around to commute. And yeah. so people aren't buying motorcycles to be cool, which I think that's going to be one of the largest problems part of this. And even in Latin America, yeah. everybody yeah. has a motorcycle, so getting a motorcycle doesn't make you cool. Yeah, so that's I think that is uh, I think that is the challenge. So if we think about um, if we think about Harley Davidson, um, it's an interesting company that has clearly succeeded through differentiation. And um, compared to Honda, Yamaha, um, Kawasaki, Harley, uh, you know, they have sold somewhat technologically backward motorcycles, and yet, at least over the last 25 years, they've been very successful. And if we think about how they succeed through differentiation, it's, again, brand image. And one of the things you want to try and do, if you can, is try and sort of, in a fairly concise way, be able to describe why a company wins with customers. And, um, but it's, it's this brand image that it, it sort of embodies adventure, defiance, rugged individualism, and which sells other products, which is really important. A customizable product so that each Harley is unique. And then I think access to a community of like-minded bikers. So you're hiring it to make you interesting. It's related to your your identity, your status. You hire it to give you uh, a sense of community um, as well, which I think those are sort of very different jobs to be done than someone who's going out and looking at a bike because it's fuel efficient, it's easy to handle, and you know, sort of the more traditional features that we talked about when we look at that tr sort of traditional customer segmentation. So <clears throat> I do want to introduce, we'll talk about this more next time, different ways that, that companies segment customers and try and design products to sell to them. A lot of times you'll segment customer, customers based upon their demographics, your age, your education, how much money you make, right? It could be by, by company, by size of company, by industry. That's one way to, to segment customers. And that tends to be an easy way to do it. Um, but it's not as um, specific as uh, segmenting customers based upon the features they want, the attributes. That's what we did here. So that's going to get a little bit closer, because you could have two customers that are very different ages that want the same feature set. And then if you think about the job to be done, it's sort of a, a deeper dive on feature set. It's really trying to understand what you what what job you have to get done and, and how you're hiring this product to help you do a job. And that job, it could be a functional job. It's get me somewhere fast or reliably. 
but, but it could be an emotional or social job. It could be, I want it to help bring me, you know, give me status and help me be part of the Harley Owners Group, right? Or I want it to make me feel a certain way. We tend to hire certain brands to make us feel or identify with certain things. And so, it, so in fact, we hire products for different kinds of jobs. And, and it's important to understand that when you're trying to differentiate in the minds of the customer. So, um, so we'll talk more about differentiation next time. Um, and, and the focus will be on differentiation. If you're going to succeed through differentiation, you really have to understand your customer deeply. You have to understand their psyche. You have to understand you know, what circumstances they find themselves in and when they're trying to hire a product or service, what they're trying to get done. So understanding that customer and the consumption, what we'll call a consumption chain, I'll describe that more next time, uh, is really important. With a cost-based advantage, you care a lot more about understanding the supply chain and the cost of producing a product. You have to be really good on the cost side, right? And it doesn't mean you can completely ignore costs if you went through differentiation. Harley couldn't completely ignore it. Sometimes you just have to satisfy it. You have to be good enough on the cost side and the quality side so that you can differentiate on things that you know, will matter to your customers at the, at the end of the day. All right, thanks. We'll see you next Monday. Okay.